Hi, everyone. Uh, so glad that you could join us for this discussion. We're just going to give it a few minutes for folks to settle in, and then we'll get started. So just about one more minute and then we'll get this show on the road. Thank you all for being here today. Good morning, good afternoon. All depends on where you're joining us from today. Feel free to say hello in the chat. Got Niagara representing. Windsor. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Okay, we're at 11.02 and we will get started. So, hi everyone, my name is Jamal Jones. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Associate Director, Library, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Access at the University of Waterloo. I'm also co-founder of Next Gen Men. I am a husband and a father of two boys. I am joining you from Kitchener, Ontario today. And that is the land of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, with land acknowledgments, um, I love to always do my best to try to, to tie them together to the topic that we're discussing today. Um, and when I think about sort of having discussion about engaging men, um, I really just want to say that I think it's important that we recognize that there are practices within Indigenous communities who have been thinking about this for a long, long time. And for you to figure out whose land you're on um, and learn. And I think as we learn um, through practices that have been passed down um, through their traditions and their cultures, that there are some things to learn. So for myself, I'm always opening myself up to new ways of learning um, and reading. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you today. I want to thank you all for being here today for this important conversation. By showing up, you are demonstrating that promoting gender equity and preventing gender-based violence in our post-secondary institutions also matters to you. A couple of quick notes on Zoom. If it's helpful to you, you may turn on closed captionings. Um, you can find that feature on the bottom panel. And as you think of questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box. Uh, the button for the Q&A can be also found at the bottom panel. We can't promise to answer every question, but we'll do our best. And also feel free to contribute uh, to conversation in the chat. So three things are gonna happen in this session. You will learn evidence-based tips about how to progress gender justice in post-secondary post -secondary institutions. You're going to hear how our panelists have used those tips in practice. And three, you'll gain new resources to continue learning, groaning, and taking action through your work. So this is how we're going to spend our time together. We'll start by doing an introduction to the topic. We'll talk to our panelists and to their work. We'll move on to the panel discussion itself. We'll have a, some time for Q&A, about 10 to 15 minutes with the audience. And then before we wrap up, we'll ensure that you know how you can keep in touch, uh, contact the organizations of the speakers and access resources to keep learning and taking action. So Charlotte is going to launch a quick anonymous poll to give us a sense of who is in the room. So please take a couple minutes to complete this poll.
There it is. So we'll give it just another 15 to 20 seconds to fill out this anonymous poll. Let us know where you're from. All right. Well, if we can, let's share those poll results. Okay, thank you. So many people here are familiar or somewhat familiar with the topics that we'll be talking about today. Thank you for taking part in that poll. So before we get started, I'd like to start by referring to some terms that we'll be talking about today. So firstly, what is gender justice? Gender justice is the actions we can take that will both promote gender equity and reduce and ultimately eliminate gender-based oppression and violence. Gender equity recognizes that we live in a patriarchal society in which women and gender diverse folks inherently experience inequities in terms of distribution of power, resources, representation, and access to opportunities. Gender equity is about recalibrating and redefining power, resources, and opportunities to correct those gaps. What is gender-based violence? Gender-based violence is harm that is perpetrated against a person or a group of people because of their actual or perceived sex, gender expression, and or gender identity. It is not limited to physical violence. It can take many forms. Gender-based violence can happen as a form of social punishment or breaking the rules about gender. For instance, violence against queer and trans people might be directed at them for expressing themselves in ways that are inconsistent with existing gender expectations. Gender-based violence is a useful lens through which we can see patterns of violence related to power. Whenever a group of people is systematically disempowered, they're increasingly targeted for violence. So for example, women are almost four times more likely than men to have been sexually assaulted at least once since age 15. For women with a disability, that's even higher. And gender-based violence is a useful lens through which we can look at violence between men. Think about how often violence between men is connected to establishing dominance hierarchies by attacking one another for failing to perform masculinity the right way. So why work with men to achieve gender justice? Most men do not want to hurt themselves or others. They don't want to be part of the problem. They want to be part of the solution. So let's create those opportunities. Despite not wanting to be part of the problem, most violence is still committed by men. So if we want to do something to prevent it, it's important to work with men and boys to encourage their healthy development and support them in taking on positive pro-social roles and identities. Boys and men are also harmed by restrictive gender norms. They deserve safety and freedom to be their true selves and the deeper relationships and increased well-being they could have as a result. Lastly, the burden of repair and and prevent harm should not fall to women and gender diverse people alone. Why work towards gender justice via post-secondary institutions specifically? Women in post-secondary institutions or PSIs are, are at a greater risk for sexual assault than women in the general population. The structure of these PSIs might also facilitate secondary victimization. The victim may live in the same residence building, be enrolled in the same classes as the perpetrator, or be unable to avoid certain locations. This, an, this can also contribute to social exclusion or harassment, particularly if the victim is pursuing legal action. As of 2022, nearly 40% of 25 to 34 year old Canadian born women had a bachelor's degree in, or higher compared with a little more than 25% of Canadian born men. Women are pursuing higher education at record rates. Meanwhile, for men, these numbers have stalled. Gender equality and violence prevention scholars, advocates, and advocates increasingly highlight the significant role that men and boys can and should assume as co-beneficiaries, advocates, and allies in promoting gender equality. However, 
few PSIs in Canada currently have violence prevention programming that focuses on men and masculinities. So now that we've established the context for our topic today, what is Pathways and why does it exist? Pathways is a project funded by Women and Gender Equality Canada and is supported by NextGen Men. The goals of the Pathways are to connect gender justice practitioners like our panelists with community leaders like you who are hungry for change. Build a bridge between academic research and action. This is why our panel discussion today is based on research from SHIFT, the project to end domestic violence. And three, to increase the number of people, especially men, about doing gender justice work where they live, work, play, and worship. All right, that was a lot, um, but now I'm very excited to move on to the main event and talk with our panelists. All of our panelists are deeply experienced in this work of engaging men and boys in gender justice with post-secondary institutions. They have been working to engage men in these issues and supporting meaningful change in their unique post-secondary settings. I'll call on each of the panelists briefly to introduce themselves and share why gender justice is important, just that gender justice and post-secondary education matters to them. So let's start with Jasmine Mendoza. Jasmine, please tell us about, a little bit about yourself and why gender justice and post-secondary education matters to you. Uh, thanks, Jamal. Again, uh, Jasmine Mendoza, my pronouns are he, him, and I am calling in from the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, as it says there, I am a registered psychologist at the counseling uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson University, and I'm located in their Center for Student Development and Counseling, where I provide therapy um, <laughs> to students on a whole host of issues, and most recently, or at least the, the, the last part of my uh, my career thus far has really been focused on gender-based violence, especially those students that have been uh, found under an investigation with respect to student codes of non-academic misconduct or the sexual violence policy at the university for disciplinary counseling. Um, I think in terms of your question, Jamal, for me, the importance of doing gender-based uh, violence work, and, and I've been doing this work since 1998, um, has been really about understanding that this is a social issue, right? This is more than just an issue between two people. In fact, it's much more than that. And we know that it's actually about power and control, but because it's a societal issue, we have to change social norms. Um, and so I think one way to do that is working with men um, and male identified folk. And I have found um, it rewarding, even though these are difficult conversations to have, to help move people uh, to much more healthier, respectful, uh, and equitable uh, relationships, as well as uh, lives for that matter. So in short, that's that's very much why I'm committed to doing this work and have taken up uh, gender justice work and gender justice advocacy. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And next, we'll have Will Prakash Fiarcha. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so my name's Will. I use he and pronouns. I manage the Sexual Violence Prevention Education Program at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, um, on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe Nations, uh, lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Um, I have a sort of roundabout way of, of getting into the work, spent some time in higher ed, then became a science teacher, my undergrad's in bio, um, worked nonprofit for a while, including a couple of years with the Sexual Assault Support Center of Waterloo Region and their Male Allies program. Um, and that's really where I got started in the whole gender justice on post-secondary campus conversation through um, the Sexual Assault Center's partnership with Wilfrid Laurier University and running a men's learning community there. Um, uh, and then moved back to McMaster where I did my undergrad in wellness, uh, we're first in student wellness and then now in the sexual violence prevention response office. Um, so in my role as prevention education manager, I run peer to peer education programs, do trainings for staff, faculty and students. Um, and I get to do quite a lot of work as well around men and masculinities, which I, I really love. Um, for me, gender justice is important. Um, I have a story to share, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that later on, I think, in the webinar. Um, but I think recognizing the unique positionality of, of all men uh, um, and what we're able to bring to the work, I, I sort of had a few moments 
um, in the past decade of my life that really brought the privilege and unique social location that I have into, uh, it just kind of all clicked in my head as, as a feeling and sort of a calling to, to do this work um, in post-secondary. Um, and so I'm excited to explore that through the panel with everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Will. And we have our final panelist, Rob Giardino. Please tell us a bit about yourself and why gender justice and post-secondary education matters to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Giardino. I'm a registered clinical counselor. I'm currently working at the University of uh, British Columbia on the Okanagan campus, situated on the unceded and traditional territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. Uh, I hold two master's degrees, one from the University of Toronto and one from the University of Northern British Columbia. I'm also currently working to complete my doctoral work designing a psychotherapy intervention specifically for men using the principles of self-compassion. Um, why gender justice and post-secondary matters to me? I think it's so important. Um, in my work, I have um, been working with in residence life in uh, orientation and transition and now for the last long while in counseling. I've always been interested in the ideals of social justice, feminism, intersectionality. Um, but I often feel that um, society or pop culture and all kinds of other issues perpetuate unhealthy stereotypes onto young people, both men and women. And that impacts their behavior and expectations of themselves and others when they come to post-secondary. As a student services professional, I would often work to try to make events and programming safe as possible for students. Um, and in that work, we're starting to have more upfront and direct conversations about healthy behaviors around everything from substance use to consent and more, um, which is great. But I think that the work needs to continue and needs to grow. I think that the topics we're going to explore today have a lot to do with uh, connecting to those types of themes. I also find that the fight uh, of violence against women is often championed by women or members of uh, the gender non-diverse community. And I definitely think that we need to involve more men in the violence against women and um, that this is a men's issue. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing that. As you can see, our panelists today have a wealth of experience uh, in different different communities, but also very, very directly ex tied to the experience of what we're talking about today, which is post-secondary institutions. So today we'll be leveraging the SHIFTS 2022 report titled Calling in All Men, 26 Recommendations for Engaging and Mobilizing Men to Prevent Violence and Advance Equity as the basis for our discussion today. So the first recommendation that we're going to explore is that <clears throat> Men need to be explicitly targeted in interventions aimed at violence prevention, gender equality, diversity, and inclusion. Men need to be made visible, not just as part of the problem, but as necessary part of the solution. And that's recommendation number six. So I'm gonna to turn to Jasmine. In your experience, how important has it been to develop interventions, not just with men in mind, but to actively target them as stakeholders in these complex issues? Yeah, I, I think two things. One is, is uh, A, that um, if, if we don't explicitly target men in interventions, then what ends up happening is we end up continuing to still perpetuate the violence, uh, continuing to perpetuate the gender-based violence harm uh, that continues. And so um, I typically see men at the end of a student judicial affairs procedure, right? And then, of course, I, as I had mentioned earlier, I see them for disciplinary counseling. And so in that work, do I hold men accountable and responsible for the harm that they've caused on our campus? Um, if I didn't do that work, you know, those individuals, although they may be subject to a suspension or subject to some type of sanction, without having some type of therapeutic intervention, um, you can imagine that person still going out into the community, at least in our post-secondary community, and still committing those harms, right? That we can't just take a learning-based approach to change, right? That sometimes there needs to be uh, a therapeutic, a counseling, a clinical approach to encouraging people to change and to um, A, stop their behaviors that are harmful, but also at the same time, um, 
you know, replace those or have better behaviors be in its place. Uh, I think the other is, is, is that when I've been able to engage uh, men in this work uh, and they're able to see that their actions have been harmful, what ends up happening is, is that sometimes they make the best allies. And what I mean by that is, is, is that, you know, if they're convinced and recognized and truly take authentic responsibility and accountability for the harm that they've caused and to kind of borrow Maya Angelou's words of like, when you know better, you do better. What ends up happening is that they they then feel empowered to start calling in um, men as well that may may be causing harm. And so sometimes I I have found that the men that I've worked with come back a year later and say, you know, Dr. Jez, I did this right? Like I, I called out one of my friends on my team, or I called out one of my friends and called him in and said, you know, what you're doing, your partner, unacceptable, right? And that's when I think, wow, right? Like that's where, um, you know, the gender justice work that I'm doing starts to become a little bit of a movement, right? So that's the other second reason why it's important to explicitly target men in these interventions, not only just to help them do better behaviors, it's also to spread that um, knowledge, if you will, right? Because the, the knowledge shouldn't just be kind of with the experts, right? I always, I always tell the students that I work with, like, you know, this, this helps your friends too, right? And then, and then they have the conversations with me about, you know, Dr. Jess, how do I talk to my friends about these issues, right? And then we craft up words that are authentic to them. And I say, you don't want to borrow my words, right? Like you, you have better words than I do and encourage them to talk about it and hold their friends responsible and accountable as well. So those 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 are at least at, at the top, very top of my mind why I think we need to explicitly target men in in such intervention. Thank you, and I I really love the way that you phrase that. Is like once they they can become really great allies once they've taken authentic accountability, um, and what that leads to is the movement and calling in other men and boys and peers. Uh, out on calling them in to talk about it uh, and calling them out on the behaviors that are that are harmful. Um, and I think that's really important, building up that movement. It needs to become something. So I, I'm really, I really value the work that you you do um, and the experiences that you've just shared with us. Thanks, Jamal. Can I just can I just yeah. add one thing to that too? Is this is that you know the more people like that, that we get talking and I've been working since 1999 on this issue like even before coming to the post secondary uh sector was I you know I was I was firmly entrenched in doing probation and parole work and working in correctional services of Canada um what was unsatisfying about that approach was is, is that it was very prescribed what that community is right but working at post secondary I, I feel like we're working with future leaders right mm -hmm. and that if if and, you know, and sometimes I'm not just working with people that have had a finding of uh, sexual violence, um, you know, with respect to a policy at the university. Sometimes what ends up uh, happening is I'm work working with student leaders, right, male student leaders, like uh, at student unions or sports teams, where, you know, talking about it, you know, raises consciousness. But I think most importantly, it's helping some of those male students Take, take up leadership roles. And something that I've really been focused about is, is that there's not one way to be a leader, right? Uh, talking about gender-based justice. There, there are some of us that are talkative like me that will just keep talking and talking and talking, right? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it back to you soon enough. And then there are others that can do it quietly. And that's what I talk about as well. And I think what matters is, is we need to interrupt, you know, this th these unhelpful patterns of power and control you know, that all of us have learned and need unlearning and continual reminders to unlearn. So anyways, just needed to add that before it became unfinished business for me. So thanks, Jamal. Thank you so much. And yeah, you, you touched on the piece about language, right? And um, there's different ways to do it. And for myself, um, I just recently learned what the word riz meant. Um, so it shows that like, I don't speak in the language of today's youth, um, bringing that their own authentic selves to the language not just verbally, but those nonverbal things. Some people are very loud and can can do it through those words. Now there's are more action oriented. So just, I love that you allow them to take up leadership in a way that works for them. So thank you so much, Jasmine. All right. So next we want to talk about the importance of including more diverse male identified populations in our intervention. 
And that's recommendation number seven. Uh, one of the key findings from Schiff's research was that when doing violence prevention and gender equity work with men, we should take an intersectional approach and work with diverse groups of men. Will, can you tell us a bit about your experience working with diverse groups of men in post-secondary settings? Thanks so much. I think there's another piece related here to language and how we view gender-based violence. So often framing this, um, still I hear sometimes as a women's issue, using that very sort of binary language, this perspective of, of man assaults women. And we know there's obviously a gendered dynamic to um, to this, this violence. And we also know that that's not the whole picture. And especially when we frame it as a women's issue, I think um, men then can step aside and say, well, it's not it's not my issue, right? So I love using the language of gender-based violence prevention and response, the language that our panel today is, is on gender justice. I think that that's um, really powerful. Um, that language as well, that or that framing of like man assaults woman is also very binary. And we know that non-binary people experience really high rates of gender-based violence. Um, for my own self as a queer man, I felt like that perspective and the way I was taught about gendered violence when I was younger um, sort of left me out of the conversation, right? And it's easy to think, um, you know, that I, I'm not part of the problem at all and queer people aren't part of the problem. You know, if I'm a man who's not attracted to women, um, well, then this isn't, this isn't an issue for me and I don't need to be engaged in it, right? And that was kind of the implicit message that, that I received. Um, I've heard, you know, gay men touching women's breasts and say, I'm allowed to do so because I'm not attracted to her or uh, making misogynistic jokes and thinking that, that they get that pass. So I think that's something I felt in myself. I even remember um, on my drive to Waterloo for the, uh, for the second interview for my job in the male allies program at the sexual assault support center of Waterloo region, thinking to myself the whole drive, like, I'm not gonna get this. I'm not who they're looking for. The person who's supposed to do this work is supposed to be like a big, like straight bro. And like, who's gonna listen to me? I don't have a place in this work. I remember thinking that thought on my way to that interview. Um, I think a lot of the framing also, um, again, we wanna look at the gendered patterns and we wanna look at the reality that there are men who've experienced sexual violence and gendered violence and, um, what's what's their role in this work as well, right? Only framing men as um, possible future perpetrators or as bystanders to intervene um, isn't the full picture. There are men who've been on the receiving end of this harm, and that's part of the diversity of, of the men engaged in this work as well, and we need to talk about those nuances. Um, I think about, um, I think about, things like the different contexts that men come into this work from. So for fathers, you know, the way um, gender gender stereotypes are reinforced onto parents and onto children. Um, when I think about stereotypes based on, on race for men, you know, um, often like black men being painted as hyper-masculine and, mm -hmm. and South Asian men painted as asexual and East Asian men as more mm -hmm. feminine and all these kinds of patriarchal stereotypes that intersect with race. When we just gloss over this issue as sort of man assaults woman, women's issues um, and simplify it, we lose how different men are going to engage with, enter into these conversations um, how they're able to interrupt um, gendered violence day to day, right? So we really need to be thinking about um, that diversity and moving beyond men as, as a monolith. Um, since 2021 here at McMaster, I've been running a webinar series called Blueprints for Change, um, which I took from Bell Hook's book, uh, The Will to Change on Men, Masculinity and Love. And that's a regular series, and it's been really fun for me to host because I've been able to invite a variety of men in from different professional backgrounds and different lived experiences and social locations. So we've talked about challenging femphobia in queer men's communities, celebrating trans masculinity without recreating toxicity, masculinity and athletics, celebrating Black masculinities, exploring masculinity and disability, emotional literacy for guys in relationships. So through each of those speakers who are able to speak to those different areas, it's been really interesting to see as well on the webinar, um, definitely some, some repeat attendees and oftentimes 
a lot of new names on that attendee list because we're able to speak to some of the nuances of the different experiences athletes on campus, black men on campus, guys in relationships. Um, and I think that that's uh, been um, a really key thing. And I, I, so I think moving, yeah, again, just to reiterate, moving beyond men as a monolith and recognizing the diversity of men and that we're all coming into this conversation in different ways and we're all able to interrupt this harm in, in unique ways is central to um, the work that we're doing on our campuses. Thank you so much, Will. Um... Yeah, I, I love that you're speaking to the nuances of the different kinds of men and types of men and diverse groups of men and how these implicit messages are received and how that then gets translated to the cultural identities that are attached to who they are. Um, and I think that's really important and needs to be done more often. Um, I want to say two things, shout out Bell Hooks, shout out Sask, um, but you also dropped in uh, a term that not everybody might know. So you said femphobia. Would you be able to maybe just give us a, a quick definition of, or your working definition of femphobia? Well, so I had I had a friend on who who's done their doctoral research on this. So I won't give as great a definition as my friend uh, Dr. Adam Davies at University of Guelph. Um, but but within within queer men's community specifically, they were referring to um, any any sort of association to things perceived of as feminine um, and the way that that sort of, um, yeah, minimized or, or seen as something to be shameful of. Um, but thanks for catching that. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, and I, I think about that when we used to do, we probably still do this programming. I'm far removed from the programmatic side of, of Next Gen Men now, but doing that gender box or the man boxes activity that we called it is, the things that are the emotions and the the actions that were related to femininity or things as men and male identified folks were taught to to be afraid of in a sense. So like if it's if it's seen as feminine, we must push it away. Um, so it's somewhat similar to that definition. Um, and this is for all the panelists. Um, a question just dropped in the chat, and I'm just interested to get your 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 opinions on this. Thoughts on the phrase um, sexualized violence to be more inclusive. Uh, as I'm speaking, you will not. Maybe you might jump in, but if uh, Rob um, and Jessamine, if anything pops up for you, you might be able to jump in on this as well. Do you think yeah, that's more inclusive? Yeah. And speak really quickly. Um, it's an it's interesting, and I'm so glad that person asked that um, question. Um, I've noticed that language. Um, not, I don't know if I've seen it so much in Ontario colleges and universities, but I feel like I've noticed it um, in other parts of the country, even in the policy or office names, but not mm. here so much. I could be mistaken. Um, we're sort of, right now in our office, we use the language of sexual violence. We're kind of pushing to change the office and policy name to gender-based violence, which our definition of sexual violence in our policy is, is already kind of gender-based violence as the broader thing. Um, I've honestly not had heard much about that kind of conversation. Um, so I'd be curious to hear if if Rob or Jasmine has any, um, have any insights on that language, but I'd be happy to, re I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna do some research on it myself after this session. So thanks for bringing that up. Thanks for the questions. They're always great for us to think about things in different ways as well. Will, Will can I just, uh, or can I just address um, or <laughs> respond to Will perhaps? I, I was just thinking that, um, I think sometimes we get uh, hung up on the idea that there's only one term. And I kind of think of about how gender-based violence harm is, is a great term because it's an umbrella and catch-all, but then underneath it, can you have sexualized violence, uh, you know, economic violence? Like you can have all these different forms of violence underneath it, right? I think um, what I appreciate about gender-based violence, and I know that at this institution, at my institution, I've certainly been pushing them to move towards this thinking that that is much more the inclusive term, simply because it, it can act as an umbrella and talks mm -hmm. about the dynamic, talks about the gender dynamic that Will was talking about earlier, and uh, is much more helpful in understanding. Because I think, uh, I think if you say sexualized violence, that can mean a whole host of different behaviors, and if I'm talking to a faculty member who's 70 years old, right, about a very problematic comment that they made, 
you know, I, you know, you can see that it's like, well, that's not sexualized violence, right? And then suddenly we've lost that person, right? But I can talk about it in terms of gender-based violence and then slowly working to the idea that it is sexualized violence, right? So what I would, I would almost say is like for all of us to not even get caught up in the binary thinking of it all, right? To in fact, actually j just say that it is like, we can use gender-based violence and sexualized violence and sexual violence and all the other types of violence. That's, that's, that's my current thinking on it. And I'm always open to being reversed as well on that thinking as well. So anyways, I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much, Jessamine. Um, Rob, if there's anything that you'd like to add, yeah. Yeah, the topic of language comes up every, uh, so I run uh, a men's group on our campus. That's a connection between healthy, um, sorry, health and wellness and um, the SV Pro office, the sexualized violence office. And uh, we, you know, anecdotally call it just the men's group. And we're constantly trying to figure out like, what should this thing be called? And uh, we've sort of landed on the idea of healthy masculinities and we sort of return to that, but it does involve a lot of um, gender-based violence. It does involve more than just uh, identifying what uh, like men's needs, like we definitely have um, a lot of interest from all genders and trans individuals who wanna participate in the group. and. Um, it, it's becoming a, a topic that is that people want to participate in, um, even though it's it, it its roots were um, supporting men in learning healthier behaviors. Um, so this is definitely a timely topic, and it is being explored absolutely. Thank you, thank you, to all our panelists for answering that question, and thanks for the question in the chat. Again, audience, um, feel free to. Um, converse with us as we're having these conversations. It's we'll do our best to monitor and, and get to them as, as we as we talk to them, uh, to our panelists. So Rob, I'm gonna stick with you. Um, in Schiff's report, they state that men are highly influenced by other men and more could be done to leverage the power of these relationships to build positive, supportive relationships and change harmful male norms. And that's recommendation number 12. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about the power of men's relationships with other men and, and how that's impacted your work? Absolutely. And uh, like I said, I've been running uh, this Healthy Masculinities men's group on campus um, since uh, 2019 in January we started, and we've run it every term. And uh, my examples will come from sort of that experience. And the idea of uh, recruitment came initially to mind when I was reading this recommendation under key entry points for engaging men and mobilizing men. And even though the group is, you know, well communicated across campus formally through our communications office, um, it really was the word of mouth that attract that would we would get a participation from. So we got uh, every every term we get about 50-50 returners and new folks. And um, this idea that men are looking for connection and they're looking for example and they want to participate and they want to learn um, how to engage in this, in, in, in our current society. Uh, it, those are all important things that Jamal mentioned earlier in the, in the topic. And um, so this idea of word of mouth comes to mind. And uh, what would happen is we would often not close the group every term until about week four because we would advertise for four weeks and then we would start the group around week five of, of the term. And then uh, we would still, people from people coming, people who are curious, people dipping in their toes would come and then they would go and talk about it with their friends at the gym, with their friends in class, um, with their roommates. And then they would often ask, can I, like they email me privately, like, can I bring someone? And I'd be like, and I would, I, yes, I have to vet them and I have to talk about group norms and stuff with them. but. Yes, <laughs> and it was powerful to be able to see that uh, this idea of, you know, the word of mouth and the power of that. Um, additionally, uh, we would, um, sorry, I just lost my track. I decided, for example, one term not to run the group. And there was so much vocal outreach against that decision. Uh, the men began to rely on this group for connecting to others, for um, the ideas of uh, socialization and having a space to talk about this. 
and and this is not just men this is anyone male identified so trans folks etc uh, members of the lgbtq community etc so what happened was we we have a um a chat room where i would normally just say things like hey folks uh i'm late or hey folks the room has changed or things like that right but this chat room became such an important piece of finding connection. And it would be a place where they would share things, they would share stories. They would, like one time we had um, uh, them joining um, a, a sports team together. We had them sharing ideas like I just got engaged. Um, it became this place of community. And that was all because they were pulling each other in, I think, and this idea of leveraging the connection. And we often would talk about, okay, how do we leverage now, like maybe our athletes or maybe our, our student leaders. And we always had some representation in those realms. And also we would see lots of representation from, uh, you know, the school of nursing or the school of social work and things like that. Um, but they're championing, championing other men who they think can perpetuate the idea of the ripple. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, 15 of us in a room, we are bringing this into the community. We're talking about it. We're sharing what we learn. Um, and that is, again, the power of connection, I think. Thanks for sharing that. I think one thing that really stood out to me um, was sort of the way that you were speaking about the seeking behavior of men to have these conversations. And I think often there's this uh, stereotype of men are not health seeking um, by by nature. Let's use that as like a, a terrible term to describe it, right? Um, men don't want to seek health behavior models or better themselves. But this is, for me, showing that men are health seeking um, and not the traditional sense of like running and, you know, exercising, but like the emotional aspect of it. So it's really, really love to, to hear that. Um, I'm curious to hear sort of about the dynamic, right? You said there's 50, 50, right? So 50% are returners and 50% are newcomers. Like what does that level, of, I'm gonna call it complexity, but what does that dynamic add to the group settings? What do you see? I definitely see an element of role modeling a little bit. And I also see this idea that the, the returners are hungry and eager for more conversation. And even though that the themes of the week you know, don't necessarily change from week to week, from group to group, the group has evolved definitely over term to term to term. Um, and we also respond a little bit to what students want to talk about. It's so it's as much as it's a psycho ed group, it's also a process group. Mm -hmm. And holding space for the ideas and the stories of the participants become so important. And sometimes we like every every group we would just do a check-in. How are you on a scale of one to 10? You know, how are you feeling? What's going on for you? Blah, blah, blah. Check-in could take an hour <laughs> because they've got <laughs> so much stuff to bring. And they're so eager to share. I saw this in the news and it's so unjust and blah, blah, blah. And they're, and they're so engaged. Um, so that is where we would see some of that uh, eagerness from both the returners and the new folks. And just this idea of being able to find like-minded individuals or having a space to reconsider or explore um, these ideas where really there isn't really a, any other space in their daily life to do so. Maybe mm -hmm. behind closed doors, et cetera, but maybe that's it. Yeah. I love that you speak to sort of that this being a process and maybe this, that portion of your, your answer might be helpful to the question that's in the chat, which is, what are your thoughts on interventions related to the idea of effects of and effects to masculinity when speaking to folks that are struggling to move within the conversation idea of masculinity and are somewhat open to the idea of learning harmful behaviors? So for me, what I, how I'm hearing that question is like, for those who are struggling about talking about masculinity, but are somewhat open to the idea of changing some of these things, how do how what what are your thoughts on the interventions and you've sort of touched a piece on the piece of like this is not just a an educational group which it is part of but there's a process to this um maybe in like two to three minutes what does that process look like yeah wow that's a big 
uh, conversation. And I think that uh, a lot of it has to come with, again, the creating the safety in the group, creating the norms and, and how we bring up topics, how we talk about things um, without judgment, without bringing up um, hegemonic masculinity, without bringing up toxic masculinity, uh, we want to be able to to be able to to hold space for uh, maybe we don't have the answers. Maybe it is there is no right answer right now. We're exploring wrongdoing that we've done. We're explore we're reconsidering behaviors that we've done, ideas that we have, um, thoughts about our dads, thoughts about other men in our lives, um, and that becomes a bigger topic. And that that becomes the holding pen for the process of the exploring and the people really, sort of the students um, feed off that opportunity to reconsider um, pop culture, to reconsider their heroes, to reconsider their um, themselves, if that makes thank sense. You. That does make sense. And thank you so much, Rob. Um, thanks for that question in the chat. Um, so coming back around to you, unless I heard a, unmute. Um, I didn't. Okay. Going back around to you, Jessamine, and the recommendation that we're looking at this, um, looking at the importance of integrating a trauma-informed approach into efforts to engage men. Jessamine, what does the what does a trauma-informed approach mean, and how does this recommendation resonate for you? Right. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to also add on or build upon what Rob was talking about with the previous question, which was, I, I think what I in terms of, I like that word inoculating. How do you inoculate hmm. young men to, of course, there's like viral stuff out there, like uh, on TikTok, on social media, on Discord, on all of these things that, you know, uh, that are constantly evolving. Uh, but something that I talk a lot to young men about is um, scrutinizing things. And does this actually meet your values, right? And I think that that, and does it meet like values of respect, dignity, equity, right? And, and that we ought not to kind of automatically jump onto a bandwagon, you know, that we should really think and scrutinize. And that I talk about sometimes how social media um, creates a sense of urgency, right? And mm -hmm. creates a sense of rightness without, without checking that out. And so I, I always say that technology is always gonna be constantly evolving, but the skill to have is to scrutinize and compare against these values that we're talking about. So again, are, is it based in equity? Is it is it based in respect? Is it, is it based on any of those things, right? So I, I just wanted to ask that question. Uh, to come to this recommendation, integrating a trauma-informed approach, I just have to say that I think when you, uh, in the work that I do, uh, I talk about accountability taking and responsibility taking all the time, right? Whether it's in session or it's in the community itself. And I don't think that you can talk about accountability and responsibility taking without touching upon people's shame. And then what that does is when people feel ashamed, there's a number of things that they wanna do, but most and foremost in, in, in the people that I speak to the most about the, these topics is they wanna avoid uh, the shame and by extension, avoid responsibility taking. Um, but the reason why I believe that the shame, and I, I think when we look at some of the literature and the clinical literature on this, is, is that the shame is actually intersecting with their post, their past trauma, right? And so, you know, I'm asking people to take accountability for the harm that they've caused, right, um, towards others. But as I'm doing that, they can't help but think, but no one took accountability when I was harmed, right? And I think I you know, I don't know that we need the literature to, to tell us what we probably already know intuitively that harm begets more harm, right? And so when, I've, when I'm when i working with those individuals and it's like their shame is being activated and it's reminding them of their past trauma, they want to talk about how someone didn't take accountability in their life. And I think, you know, when I first started doing this work, um, you know, to be quite frank, supervisors and past instructors had said, you know, that's just them deflecting their blame, right? Onto something else, they're getting distracted from actually talking about what they need to take responsibility and accountability for. But what I found actually in the clinical work and where the, the clinical practices move towards is inviting people to take responsibility, but recognizing that they've had trauma in their lives, right? And so sometimes it isn't necessarily working through the trauma, but it's being able to say, I recognize the trauma that you have, right? 
but we also need you to take responsibility and accountability for what you've done, right? And if you can do that, then we can start looking at the trauma, you know? And the men that I've worked with have been able to hold that, right? And hold these two things that are true for them. And again, I, I think you can work with someone who has harmed others, you know, with respect to gender-based violence without recognizing the harm that they've endured. It just means recognizing it, you know, knowing that shame comes up, that there is this deep desire to then suddenly avoid it, but encouraging them to stay with the conversation um, and then encouraging them to take accountability and responsibility. And when then that's meaningfully done, we can then start talking about the past trauma. Most people that are referred to me for disciplinary counseling, we do that work, but surprise, surprise, you know, once we've done that work of accountability, taking the, they continue to say to me, Dr. Jess, can I see you so we can talk about the trauma? I'm like, of course, of course. I, you know, it's not like I, I didn't get into this line of work to then suddenly be, be, be clear of them, right? It's, it's more about, I suspect that. And I suspect that our, the work that we're doing here in, in gender justice is multi-stages, right? From like what Rob was talking about, about consciousness raising, to then suddenly kind of uh, what Will is talking about, engaging people on campus in these campus social dialogues to you know, what I've been talking about, which is really about kind of like getting to the substantive part, which is how do you take responsibility even if no one's taking responsibility in your life? And that's sometimes a tricky balance to, to manage. But it, and, and although that's a difficult dialogue, right? It's an important dialogue. And, and the other thing that I say in terms of a trauma-informed approach is, is that, you know, if we don't make space for it, we end up shaming them further, right? And then they go underground at that point and we've lost them. Right, you know, to other, to, you know, to how the the previous question that was asking about like these regressive viral ways, we lose them to that, you know, unfortunately. So it's important to make space and understanding that their trauma may be activated, but instead of trying to dismiss it and redirect them, it's better to acknowledge, recognize, and say, still, I see this, but we need to do this work first. And I think if you take that approach, you know, the people that I've worked with are quite receptive. You have my brain thinking about so many things. Um, the, the shame thing, I think, is really interesting. And I think you, you've you also done uh, partner assault response work. Um, and I've also done partner assault response work. And that's where I saw a lot of the shame uh, come up. And then you would see uh, disclosures of, of past traumas in those sessions. And I love how you have mentioned that you're open to continuing to work with um, these men and male identified folks after the accountability takes place to, to deal with that trauma and that shame that's coming up for them of folks who haven't taken responsibility for their actions against them. Um, and that's like one of those really tricky spots to, to be within. Um, I guess as we're here and folks may not necessarily know what accountability looks like, how, what is, can you maybe explain what does, yeah. what does accountability take look like and it probably looks a little bit differently but yeah yeah it, it means uh, authentically naming right uh, what you've done to harm the other person without denying minimizing or blaming the other right like in just a very succinct and pithy way I think you can pro in, in as much as that sounds really rehearsed um I say this quite over and over and over against the people that I work with because uh it is about naming right um, and sometimes old models would would say, well, if you can name, but then you're talking about your trauma, you're blaming, right? You're you're blaming it on something. And it's like what what I'm saying today, at least, is acknowledge that that's going to come up. Ask them to invite them to put it to the side, and then continue taking accountability. Responsibility taking is really about you know making a commitment to doing uh, better behaviors, healthier behaviors, you know. Um, and then as you make that commitment, keeping that promise and then exploring what gets in the way of sometimes keeping this promise. And I think to myself that um, responsibility taking, right? Like it, it increases trust. You know, the more you can keep your promise, you know, the, you know, the more responsible you will be in some ways. And that's what you demonstrate. And then that actually creates better relationships with people. So, so I would say, if you're going to make a promise to your partner or promise to yourself, don't use the words never, you know, don't use the words always. Like at least here in the greater Toronto area, if I say to my partner, I'll pick you up, 
I'll always pick you up on time. Like I'm bound to break my promise <laughs> and, and decrease my trustworthiness. And then he's going to think I'm a little irresponsible when, with my words at that point, right? And as we were talking at the beginning of this conversation, words are really important, right? Words are really important. So, you know, you can't talk about accountability without talking about responsibility. And accountability is always about naming, but doing so in a way that doesn't shift the responsibility onto something else. And responsibility is deeply about making a better commitment to others and to yourself and um, having integrity with it is what it is. And if there are things that get in the way, then let's talk about it. That's that's how I approach that work. Oh, thank you so much for going a little bit deeper and laying that out so clearly and succinctly. I think it's really important. And hopefully as we continue to talk, one of the things that's coming up for me is like, it seems like there's a need and if it's not addressed, it can go one way. And often that could be a negative way and maybe uh, it'll come up in more of our conversations. Uh, but we're going to turn next to our next recommendation, which is about power of using storytelling and narrative to engage and connect men, connect with men. And that's recommendation number 14. So our personal stories of passion for gender justice can help people feel inspired and connect to the work. Stories can help us make a personal connection to the problem and understand why change might benefit us and those around us. So back to Will. How have you used storytelling when engaging men and boys in gender justice? Thanks. Yeah, I think already from today we've seen how powerful storytelling is. I think in every single one of our um, responses, uh, the three of us have used um, those stories to really um, make salient the recommendation that we're speaking to. Um, we know that stories bring things to life and there's such a there's such an element, I think, of our of our humanity. So while, of course, we want our efforts to be data driven and evidence informed and all that, we we know time and time again that 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 sharing um, a narrative can really um, be more compelling than sometimes numbers and statistics and data and all that, right? So. Um, for me, what I recognized is that every time I've worked with with men students there's always been um personal stories for why they've gotten involved with with the sessions i'm running so again when i was at the sexual assault support center of waterloo region running a men's learning community at, at wilfrid laurier university um we had a great diversity of of men come out and a lot of them ended up sharing um some personal motivations for why they came there perhaps having you know had X number of women partners disclose sexual violence to them and realizing that they had a part to play in this work and wanting to learn more, that kind of thing. Um, I run a peer educator program here at McMaster um, and have been, it's been great. I've had um, diversity of, of um, applicants representing a diversity of genders, which is really nice. And a lot of the men in their applications, I was looking back um, at their applications the other night to put together my speaking notes. And I realized like a number of them when, when um, I asked, why do you want to be a peer educator, had those stories to tell um, of why they wanted to be involved, either knowing someone involved um, personally or, or something else. So um, for me, stories are so important um, with the Blueprints for Change uh, webinar series, that's always the first question I ask. What's a story or a moment that that changed the way you look at this or compelled you to do the work that you wanna do? Because I find it just um, gives us a sense of, of who the speaker is and I think can be a source of relatability, kind of speaking to Rob's point earlier about like our relationships with other men. I think there might be that relatability through storytelling. Also side note, I think I saw two of our former Blueprints for Change guest speakers in the attendee list. So shout out to Chris and, and Jeff, who was our very first um, speaker uh, a couple of years back on Blueprints for Change. Um, what I noticed though, um, that a few years ago when I created a new workshop uh, on men's allyship and ending gender-based violence, um, it was the first time I developed a session at McMaster that was um, only open to 
men. Um, there was a lot of interest from others to, to join um, and a lot of enthusiasm, which was great, but we wanted to create a space for um, men to come and learn and unlearn. And I started by sharing um, my own story of what really pushed me into this work. And that goes back to grad school where I, um, I remember being at a, a brown bag, like lunch and learn on street harassment. And there were four of my classmates talking, sharing their own stories. And I looked around the room and it was predominantly um, women classmates. I think there was maybe one other guy in the audience. And I just kind of had this realization of like how much of an issue street harassment was. Not that I thought that it was a good thing before that, but I, I understood the weight of it in a whole new way. And a few weeks later, um, a few of my friends went into San Jose. I was in grad school in a very small town in Costa Rica. We went into San Jose, the capital city, and they were chalking anti-street harassment messages on the road. And I think it was a group of seven women and myself. And we were getting a lot of attention. People were taking photos, crowding around and coming to talk to us. And what I noticed was that all of the men uh, came and talked to me first. And, and I felt like I just really understood the weight of this like a couple weeks ago at that brown bag talk. Like my like classmates are here and they're wanting to talk about this and share their experiences. But it was the realization of like, oh, I'm a guy, they're a guy, and they're taking my opinion more seriously. And this is what it maybe means to use my privilege for others. And it was just a really great realization. So anyway, I shared that story in this men's allyship workshop. I had a PhD student as well who co-facilitated with me, and he shared some of his own personal stories. And the feedback I got from that session was um, was phenomenal. I, I went through my Teams chat and found dug up one of the old messages from a, a colleague of mine, and he said, um, thank you so much for holding space for the men's allyship and ending sexual violence workshop this morning. I've learned so much about myself and feel like I need to go for a long walk of reflection. Bless your heart. I was so happy <laughs> to read that. And I think part of it was, I think a lot of it was due to myself and, and Ben, the PhD student, sharing, you know, some of our personal stories, creating that space, um, talking about shame, you know, making sure that we're not in a space of shame um, and that we're not just like shaming and blaming guys for all the problems of the world kind of thing um, and really giving that space. But I, I think so much of the impact of that workshop has been the storytelling component of it. Um, I think even in mixed gender sessions, there's which is most of my sessions, there's power to weave in storytelling through things like um, sometimes printing out survivor stories that I've I've found online um, and, you know, putting students into breakout groups to discuss. We can integrate it into um, our land acknowledgements and talk about stories of Indigenous communities and, and the harm that they've experienced and the amazing activism and resistance that, that they've um, championed. Um, sharing stories about um, how survivors are impacted by the trauma of sexual violence. And I can share you know, obviously without um, sharing any uh, confidential information, but sharing general trends of stories of what a student's experience might be like instead of just a list of symptoms of trauma or impacts of trauma. Um, it just really brings things to life to people. Um, and so I think I really encourage everyone on the call doing this work to, you know, if you're engaged in education and facilitation, think about your own stories. What what was a moment that represents a shift in your thinking um, that that is appropriate for you to perhaps share with an audience um, that might be relevant? Or if you're a researcher, I don't know if we have many researchers on the call. I think I saw a few faculty, though. You know, how if you're researching sexual gender based violence, um, are you giving space for men engaged in as research participants to tell those stories and recognize um, you know, motivations for getting involved in this work. And I think that that's a really rich source of, of data in a research sense. And I think it's a rich source of connection as an educator. Thank you. I love that what, I, what I've taken away is that stories just has the ability to, to humanize 
And it's just a very, very powerful connection tool to you to have at your disposal. And as you're sharing all of those amazing stories and your your thought process on your way to your second interview, all I can keep thinking is like, how would anybody not be lucky enough to want Will? <laughs> you know, like that's all that was going through my mind. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. I was going to say, I think there was a story in a story in there. <laughs> yeah. so, like, I don't know if that was, if people followed that, but, <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, well, we'll turn to our, our, our last uh, recommendation. So in Schiff's report, they talk about the importance of cultivating empathy in men in order to support the development of pro-social behaviors. Rob, how much of a role does empathy play in your men's group in counseling work with clients? Yeah, and I have to say that this, I was so excited when I saw this recommendation and uh, the importance of, of it. And the theme of empathy uh, comes up again and again and again in the group. Um, just this idea that uh, we can talk about it sort of academically and offer that psychoed piece on how to be empathetic uh, towards yourself, but then also in the group, the process of holding empathy and uh, being empathetic in the group, holding compassion uh, becomes such a opportunity for safety and vulnerability that I don't think men experience often, especially with each other. Um, so I think that this is a powerful recommendation and I think it taps into a lot of what Jasmine was talking about in terms of trauma-informed practice. It's again, this idea of um, identifying um, mistakes, ident identifying shame, um, and rewiring and reframing this again, like this idea of I didn't know better, but now I do. Um, a lot of those conversations come up. So for example, in the group, we talk a lot about what healthy relationships look like, what healthy friendships, we start with friendships, then we turn into relationships and then we turn into consent. Um, sort of that, 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 that. And um, when we start talking about those things, we, like, for example, we'll talk about like, what is coercion and basic, simple, like examples, like we're not even going deep here yet. And it sparks people. It triggers people. It's like, I didn't know that was coercion. I didn't know this was wrongdoing. I didn't know that, like all of this kind of stuff, um, which then people will, will share and they'll say like, you know, I, stole a kiss when I was in grade nine or whatever, like example, example, I don't want to go too, too far down the road, but this idea of being able to hold it and reframe it. And then um, holding both, like Jasmine was saying this, I'm going to learn and repair at the same time, repair myself at the same time. Um, so that's where discussions of empathy become so important. Um, and again, it, it comes down to this idea of like, I didn't want to act X way. I thought that I was supposed to. I thought that I, I had to. I thought that they wanted me to, whatever, all those kinds of feelings. So we get to explore that and hold empathy for the idea of unspoken expectations of toxic masculinity or hegemonic masculinity or whatever you want to call that. Um, but through empathy, clients get to revisit and reframe some of these you know, thoughts, feelings, behaviors in a new light. Um, and I would actually extend the idea of empathy into self-compassion. And self-compassion is something that I'm very um, interested in. It's, 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 the, it's my research. And um, the idea of the original traditional Buddhism self-compassion doesn't delineate compassion from self or others. It's just like holding compassion. And that it includes holding it for self. And you can't have one without the other. But it was the Western psychology uh, perspective in the early 1990s that decided to delineate compassion from self-compassion. But if we return to that traditional idea and this idea that generally because of socialization, you know, men have to be strong and stoic and, we, you know, women are often compassionate or whatever, you know. And again, that's seen as, less than or other than 
what how I'm allowed to behave, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to encourage this idea of self-compassion and compassion for all within men. And, and when we can carry those two things, hopefully we can educate and promote those two ideas, um, then men can learn to decide how to reevaluate the unspoken expectations to say like, mm, that's not very nice. That's not very healthy. That's not very, you know, polite, grand, whatever, however way they, they want to conceive it. Even though that they may have been grown up to, you know, call other men names or to put other men down or to belittle um, vulnerability or all those types of ideas. Self-compassion can, I think, be a window to be like, mm, should I be doing this? If that makes sense. That does make sense. And it's kind of reminded me of, I'm going to paraphrase uh, the Hooks quote, but like the first self-act of betrayal is that more boys and men learning they have to like shut down um, that part of themselves. And as you're using the terminology around like holding space and holding compassion, I just like revert to a younger version of myself and like that language, those are that emotive language was not part of my daily experience. So I'm thinking about like holding empathy for an opportunity to explore a broader range of emotions and words and things that could feel like, but are actually distinct and different. So yeah, I love sort of what you've you've shared there and that philosophy as well. So I thank have you, another Rob. example, if that's oh, okay, that time yeah. for one minute. Um, recently in the, maybe not recently, maybe, two or three groups ago, uh, maybe I would say six or eight months ago. Um, we have a lot of international students on our campus, which we love and that's great. Um, but this idea of um, the international students coming from, um, I guess, traditional Eastern cultures or collectivist cultures, that kind of an idea, coming to Canada and, and specifically UBC, which that I was shocked. But this idea that they were feeling like they had to hit the gym. They weren't tall enough. They weren't strong enough. They didn't have the muscles. They weren't attractive. Um, and a lot of that had to, again, this idea of race also comes up. So I think, like, I, I can't change that I'm not white. Um, and that already makes me feel different. Um, and then how that, how that, how those feelings interplay with now I want to find a mate and I want to you know, dates and all those kinds of things. Um, and we held space for that in the in the group. And we're realizing that the Western ideals of hegemonic masculinity were new to them and were unspoken, and yet they're still responding to them. And that was very powerful, I thought, to be to recognize that you were you were transplanted, you were changed, you were moved from a different space. You're trying to fit in, and in that process, you're taking on these terrible horrible ideas yeah they're they're absorbing they're absorbing narratives right so they're taking in a story um that is is, is harmful so right back to that recommendation around storytelling and how why that's so important so thank you so much rob thank you jessamine thank you um will um so before we jump into the q a section um we're gonna do one last audience poll uh, that, and to learn more about what do you want to learn more about. So please take a, a second to fill this out. And in the meantime, feel free to think about those questions, put those questions in the chat, uh, and we'll get to them. All right. So um, 
thank you for taking part in that last poll with us. I think we can move into the Q&A section now of, of the discussion. So I will take a quick peek to see if there's anything in the chat. I'm seeing just one comment, so I'll read that out first. So true, Rob. I was an international student and had friends from the same background. My male friends had such a hard time finding um, friends as they could never fit in. It's surprisingly worse for men than for cisgendered women to find a partner, friend in a new country based on what I've seen. So some, some lived experience there that's being shared. So some um, Q&A box, here we go, pulling it up. Thoughts on how to address young men's locker talk that's being done in the presence of a woman having a very negative experience of it. How might the woman address it? How might a man listening to the locker talk and aware of her negative experience address it? So I think all three of you are well qualified to answer that question. But maybe we'll start with Rob. Maybe I'll direct that question to you, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, definitely uh, something that happens. And I, I'm sorry that your, your friend is experiencing this. But what I want to offer is the ideas of um, social justice or um, active bystanders, the idea of calling out and calling in, trying to uh, address the situation of um, hi, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but doing making sure that you're able to be safe in that opportunity. Um, so this is again something that we talked about in the men's group is that um we sorry, the members of the of the participants of the group may have more privilege or more opportunity than others in our community. And if we feel safe, can we do so? And again, this is also brings in the idea of like men leveraging other men or leveraging the role model effect. So if I can stand up and speak to this idea, um, I could role model that for other men who probably are feeling the same. Um, so again, your priority is safety. Um, maybe finding an opportunity to address this, uh, not if not in the moment, but at a later date, again, the ripple effect how can we create conversation around this? How can we make sure that we don't normalize or we don't encourage or we don't um, permit in that in our culture? If that makes sense. Thanks for answering that, Rob. You know, if anything, do you want to add, Jasmine or Will? Yeah, I, I would just add just to build on what Rob was saying that it depends how comfortable and safe the person feels, right? If it is another man that's listening in, depending on their relationship with the the group of men in the locker, for example, like if that's like a uh, like a team leader or a coach or someone in a position of authority or power, I think it's absolutely important that they that they do intervene. And in this case, it would be more about calling out as opposed to calling in. Sometimes just being able to just be firm about that, right? Um, if that person doesn't have that type of um, relationship and it's more of a team member or even a stranger for that matter, you know, of course that person might be tentative, but I would probably say, you know, invoke a bit of curiosity, right? Or even playfulness, right? Like it might be like, ouch, like, mm -hmm. what, what did you mean by that? Right? Like it sometimes, sometimes can happen, right? And, and I know I've even done that in my own personal life, right? Uh, be, because sometimes people don't know they might not know the impact that their their statements are having, but their intention might not necessarily be nefarious in some ways, or at least they don't know that, that it can be. Um, I think uh, at least along those same lines, at least, I always remind ourselves that, you know, what is the intention of locker, locker room talk or jo jocular talk? It's really about being boastful, right? About some type of accomplishment, you know, on the field of play at, at the end of the day. However, you can still be boastful and be proud without necessarily being chauvinistic or misogynistic. And that's where the calling in kind of occurs. Like, so if there is a calling in afterwards, that would be the contour or the shape of that conversation. Um, and I, I think with respect to the woman uh, that might have to address this again, it, it depends on the relationship. Um, 
but it might need to have a series of conversations where that's explained. Like, you know, I get that you want to be boastful and pride, uh, pr proud about some accomplishment, but not at the expense of others and not at the expense where we're deriding or derogating another gender for that matter. Much. Um, the other question, maybe this will go to you, Will. Um, you might know, uh, what is the temperature on campuses today regarding the reaction or resistant or embracing from students on these conversations? Yeah, um, if I may, I was just like thinking on the first question and that's where go we're ahead, yeah. If that's okay, if we have time. I just think like, I think, well, one for the, the woman in this situation, like if for anyone on the receiving end of harm, I think it's like whatever you need to do to feel safe in that moment is valid. And then I'll just, quickly touch on, I think, with responding as as bystanders in that situation, for example, um, that like not everything's always a, a teachable moment as much as the former teacher me would love to like, let's sit down, let's have a conversation with us. Even in a call in after people might um, not be willing to, they might be a bit, a bit of a brick wall and not be willing to engage. But I think if we can set a tone for like, what was said is not acceptable in this context, they might still think those things and I can't control what people think, but I have I have some influence over the spaces that I'm in. And so if I'm able to say, hey, when we're in our, when we're in the locker room or when we're in these team meetings or whatever it is, like that's not an okay thing. And it's not ideal. Ideally, I would be able to educate this person in such a way that they never um, wanna say those things again, for example. But I think it's also an okay goal to say, to, to transmit the the knowledge that like this space, that's not acceptable. Um, and I think that can start to, I mean, obviously we wanna keep building on from there, but I think we can start to do that. Um, and with regards to the second question, the temperature on campuses today, I find, um, I, I find that people, this is my theory, um, that people I think know what to say often, but we're still seeing a lot of rates of gender-based violence. It's hard to measure because our numbers are going up with more education and awareness that resources exist. So it's hard to really track um, rise and fall of, of incidents of sexual violence on campus. But I, I find a lot of people know what to say, but then actioning it. So for example, if I ask what consent means, sometimes the students will give me better definitions than staff and faculty they'll go you know it's reversible or whatever have we taught the skills of what it means to um be okay with rejection when you're getting intimate with someone and someone wants to stop uh you can feel really rejected in that moment have we taught that through comprehensive sexuality education before university most likely not right so so i find sometimes students know what to say and then the actioning of that um, to be a gap. Um, I will say in general, there's an openness to the conversations where I find I'm meeting a lot of resistance um, as a frontline educator is when I start to um, talk about the experiences of um, trans folks. Uh, I've been doing more and more with our athletics teams, which is great. So thankful to our athletics and recreation staff at McMaster. Um, been training a lot of their student leaders in the past year or two. Um, and I ha and whenever I bring up um, talking about trans women in athletics and the the you know responses to that like and even just on Instagram some of the comments I see and reels that I'm seeing um, that's where I'm really seeing a lot of really dangerous harmful rhetoric. Um, so once we go beyond that, man assaults woman. Like I find there's a lot of resistance to. Um, when we bring in that intersectional framework in this work. Thank you, Will. Um, might have time for one more, if we can respond to it in about one to two minutes. Um, but this question is, I see more young men being protective of the idea of being a man, like being a man that resonates to more regressive behaviors. Um, I was trying to make an example to kind of tease out what that might look like, um, but how can you provide a safe space to young men to unlearn regressive behaviors at home? And I don't know who would want to take that on um, and to answer that in a minute, but 
what are some things that are going through your head with maybe some home role modeling? I think sometimes um, if uh, if a student says to me that, you know, they don't have the great greatest role model at home, right? I, I'm like, where where else can you find that? You know, like where where are there other role models? And, and sometimes it's even in popular culture, right? Or, you know, characters for that matter that might embody healthy masculinity. Um, and so sometimes it, sometimes it might not be at home. It might have to be outside of home. Or sometimes we have to might we might have to redefine what home is, you know, and so it might include extended family, and some of our students might not come from the best of families, um, you know, that can demonstrate, you know, good healthy relationships between partners um, as well. And so that's just kind of my initial impression in terms of like where where would I be able to go with that particular person if that was if that was the case if they were looking who could be a model, and I think sometimes inadvertently we become those models too right so if you're doing gender justice work we have to, they sometimes look towards us right and they say well dr does what would you do right and so um and that i treat them as uh as good challenges on our part right and so so sometimes we become the models as well um so anyways that that's my initial impression to it i'm sure i'm sure will and rob probably have other ideas and perhaps there's opportunities to engage with uh, and connect with Will and Rob and, and Jessamine later on. I know we'll be um, providing links to your organizations and how you can reach them. So I would love to answer that question more as well, but I just don't think we have the time. Um, so, but thank you so much audience um, participants for your questions, your engagement, um, for panelists, um, for your thoughtful, insightful, um, responses to the recommendations and discussion today. Um, one thing that we just hope that you'll you'll recognize is that uh, men and boys are role models, allies, and ultimately stakeholders in achieving gender justice, and our campuses are a key entry point. We hope that today you'll consider reaching out to the organization of panelists, the organizations of the panelists, to continue to learn with and from the leaders in the field. Join Pathways Community Practice, where we offer workshops with SHIFT, weekly resource sharing, connection with others and interested in this work, and supported from experienced practitioners. And then sign up for Next Gen Men's Book Club, Book Club standing for Beyond Our Own Knowledge, which invites male identifying folks to dig into a curated book and connect with each other to learn and unlearn something new about privilege and the perspectives in the world. So within the next day or so, you can expect to receive a digital handout via email with links to webinar report, webinar recording, the organizations of the panelists, as well as additional resources. If you have any questions, please contact Charlotte, the Community Project Coordinator of Next Gen Men. Again, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists, um, Jasmine, Will, and Rob. It was great to have a great conversation with you. I very much enjoyed my time today. Um, for the rest of you, I hope that you get to enjoy the rest of your afternoon um, slash evening, midday, all depending where you're joining from. Um, we really appreciated having you here today as an engaged audience. Thank you. Thank you to you too, Jamal, for holding us all together. No worries. It was, it was easy. You made it easy. <laughs>